Welcome to class. Hi. <laughs> Where are we today? Uh, this is uh, the absent minded professor. Cultural psychology. I knew it. <laughs> Page five. I knew that. Uh, 2344. We have no meaning. We have no idea what the numbers mean, but that's where we are. Okay, uh, and we have a lot to cover today, a lot of interesting stuff, at least to me. Hopefully it'll be interesting to you. One of the things I handed out, oh, I have to turn it on. I uh, wasn't on the air. Oh, you had me on the other one. Okay, good. Um, I actually was up one night this weekend and saw some other professor doing a class. And uh, he was like sitting down right there. And his email, I mean, his uh, cell phone goes off, and he goes, oh, uh, it's my wife, just a minute, and it was just kind of real laid back, so I learned a few things. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, it was, it was sort of like we're sitting in his living room. Um, okay, this handout on summary of the world, I found when I was throwing stuff together for class, and I just want to read it so we can awaken a little bit about who we are and what we're about. Only 23% of the adults over 25 in Texas have a college degree. Not that a college degree is everything. It's certainly not. You don't need a college degree to be a competent, uh, successful, interesting person uh, in your life. Uh, but the problem is those who uh, much is given, much is required. And what I like to think about is those of you who are getting a college degree is this may be the best thing and the worst thing you ever do. Because your mind will expand, you're, 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 you'll learn about life, you'll be exposed to a lot of things that you no longer go through life and put your head in the sand and pretend you don't know what's going on because, in fact, after having my class, you will know what's going on. Okay, but this is a little summary, and for those of you uh, on the tape, you can download the website, this class, under handouts, and it'll be there too. I hope you've already done that. You can do the whole course, all the handouts, and just have them with you. This is called a summary of the world. It came from the Foundation Forum. I have no idea what group that is, but somebody gave it to me. If we could shrink the Earth's population into a village of precisely 100 people with all existing human ratios remaining the same, it would look like this. So it's a percentile. There would be 57 Asians. Now I guess that includes what? All the Asian, uh, uh, the... Um, Southern Asia and Eastern Asia, Malaysia, all through there. Well, let me just read it. 57% would be Asians, 21% Europeans, 14% from Western Hemisphere, including North and South America, and 8% from Africa. 51% would be male, 49 would female, excuse me. 49 would be male. See, if y'all ever figure that out, we guys are in trouble. 70 percent would be non-white, 30 would be white, 66 would be non-Christian, 33 out of 100 would be Christian, 80 would live in substandard housing. It's hard to believe we're among the 20 percent who have good places to live. It's a cold, wet, rainy day in Houston today. Uh, half would suffer from malnutrition. This group doesn't seem to be suffering from that. Uh, one would be near death, and one would be near birth. That's one out of 100, 1%. And only 1% of the population would have a college education. And half of the entire village's wealth would be in the hands of only six people. Half of the wealth would be in the hands of six people, and all six would be citizens of the United States. So you get the disparity there. Does this resonate with anybody? Uh, I don't know, this is just kind of a like, wow. See, so many things that I take for granted that I think, oh, wow, you know, I've got it all together, aren't we neat? Without realizing how privileged we are and how interesting is the world that we live in, um, we are so wealthy and, and blessed in so many ways. Um, anyway, these things are important to be, remi to have, uh, to be reminded of from time to time. Um, I think... So we recognize that there's a bigger picture going on. Uh, what, what, the, I want to say a last word about the, uh, and in fact, I'm not going to call roll today. Let me send this around. If you'll just uh, initial your name on there. Um, 
I want to say a, sort of a final word about the acorn theory that I have brought up the first few lectures. And uh, the reason that's important as we look at, today we're going to look at ego development and what's the ego and how's that defined. And then we're going to look at uh, eventually the collective unconscious as it were. You know, we're all like these individual waves in the ocean. But the ocean, we're all similar. But each one of us is an individual wave and our ego and our own uh, unique identity is that little wave. Um, but one of the other handouts I gave you that I wanted to look at is uh, in the acorn theory, we, there were three basic ways to approach life and we all do all of these all the time probably. And one is to be inflated, self-centered, narcissistic, hedonistic, uh, materialist. To be so focused on the self-centeredness uh, uh, th that we live life that way. Or we live it in a reductionist way where we're deflated, we don't count, we're not important. Or the third way that I'm encouraging and Hillman and other psychologists do too is to consider the acorn theory. And that's to be willing to become your true self like the acorn is meant to grow its true self. And, uh, and then we looked at five different ways that we do that from last class. Do you all remember that? These are all good examples. Would somebody nod their head? That's not going to sleep. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, so when we looked at those five, five things, one is just to believe the fact that, uh, consider that this is a prime factor of life, that there's a life within us meant to be lived. Um, I'm not going to go over those again, but I guess I could. Let me just do that real quickly. Can you turn on our little deal right here? Thank you. Yeah, the third one is the willingness to become yourself, and I've changed this again, isn't this wonderful, uh, through awareness and embracing it, your, the experiences of life. Through your own awareness, consciousness, understanding, and embracing the experiences of life. And of course, anything near that will be good enough for the exam uh, that we have. And then I had five ways or challenges uh, that we facilitate this third one and one is to recognize the call or your unique destiny as a prime factor of existence. This is not a philosophy class. I recognize that a lot of people say I don't believe that or I don't agree with that and lots of philosophers, psychologists, theologians would or wouldn't but I'm presenting it to us for our edification and consideration but certainly if you say I don't believe any of this you're not gonna flunk the exam but you need to put it on the exam. <laughs> Uh, and then among those, the second one I have is to align your life with the call by following this mystery you can't see and asking tough questions about the meaning of your life. And I might say this goes on through the whole journey. Is you're always saying, well, who am I now that I've been fired from this job? Who am I now that I got this law degree but I really want to go teach English? In fact, uh, this weekend I've been training for a long bike ride and we did, my son and I did 38 miles with a group of about a thousand people. And I was, I couldn't keep up with the group I was with, but I ended up biking about 10 miles into the wind with a real nice guy. We, we kept uh, drafting one another. Y'all know what that is? Getting behind each other along the way. And uh, it turned out he uh, uh, got a business degree. Um, I think he maybe got a, a biology degree. He went and got an MBA and got a job with a Fortune 500 company. And he said, you know what I'm doing now? He said, I'm a, I'm a uh, assistant principal in an elementary school. I'm having the time of my life. And I said, it sounds to me like you found your calling. He says, that's exactly what I discovered. See? And so you see, and, he's, and he said, uh, and the other thing is I got a four and a half week old son at home. And I says, well, that's great. Too bad uh, they're not out here with us being, going through all this pain and suffering. Uh, but see, but see, see. So he was still asking these questions. You with me? He's like 35 years old, and uh, throughout all of life. And the third one, of course, is to seek to become a person of value, and not just successful in the monetary sense, but to be a valuable person as a spouse, as a parent, as a human being, with other people in the world. That people would say, uh, you know, because you lived, my life is better. You, you, you taught me something. You lived something in a way. I've been to many funerals where no one has cried. And I've always thought, was this person valued by anybody? Did anybody connect? See? Uh, by accepting the givens in your life as belonging to your destiny. And then just to, I'm going to come back to this number three in a second. 
on this handout. And then the third one, of course, was to dare to be unmasked, real, authentic before the world. To be a genuine person, to not just be a play actor. And that's not to say, you know, you... Um, there, there, of course you have a persona, a role, a mask, a r way to play. Uh, but it's being teachable, open, humble, joyful, and there's probably other things. But there's, there's very few authentic people through life as you go, you'll see, who have a sense, knowing their inflation, knowing their reductionism, knowing their limits, being, knowing when they're conceited and pompous and prideful, knowing when they're suffering from a low self-esteem and uh, like they're not worth anything. See, an authentic person is not intimidated by the ups and downs of life. They know that's all part of it. And, and I mean, anyone who can say, I was ro wrong, like Fonzie on the old TV shows, and with contrition admit a mistake, I don't think I ever heard my parents ever sorry for anything growing up. And my parents, wonderful people they were, they both passed on. They, they did some things that, that they should have said, I'm really sorry. I, I wounded you. I stepped on you, I misspoke, I shamed you in front of your friends. You see, authentic real people are not afraid to be uh, eat crow, as it were, from time to time. Are you with me on that? How that happens? Yeah. And again, that, that's rare to find someone like that because we're all, you know, think we're trying to be perfect or live out something. And then the fifth one here is to risk becoming a co-creator for the healing of the world. And this isn't a call for everyone to go into the mission field. Um, but it is certainly in cultural psychology is realizing I know I'm part of the problem because I'm full of things within me, shadowy things that want to compete and outdo other people, I'm full of insecurities. I know I'm full of insecurities and I'm so afraid somebody's going to get something I'm not going to get. But uh, I want to be part of the answer too and this is part of what this is honoring that our life can enrich or curse the rest of us, your life can. Or uh, we need uh, you to become your true self. Your kids need you to do that. Your kids need you, the kids you don't have. Does anybody have any kids in here? No kids. I mean, well, I won't say it that way. Um, it, it, your children will need you to be an authentic person and to grow and to take this path in honoring your, your acorn, your, your true self. And then, um, let me uh, just leave that right there. This is the thing I'm going to read and uh, I don't expect you to get it on uh, here because it's hard to read, but you can get it from the uh, handouts and let me step around front and read this because this is what's really interesting. I'm going to tell you this story quickly. Uh, this is a friend of mine. Uh, you can actually read that, can't you? You can't? No. Okay, well just look on, or you can leave it there and maybe put me in the corner or something. Can you do that, Stacy? Can you put me in the corner of the picture? Yeah. This really feels my, it feeds my inflation, doesn't it? <laughs> I can't wait till tomorrow. As my father said, I get better looking every day. Can you put that up there? Yeah, hi, there he is. A legend in his own mind, Dr. Herb again. Uh, okay, uh, several years ago, uh, a friend of mine uh, who, who I got to know was about 10 or 11 and he had some problems. Actually, when he was like three, uh, he was in a car accident, and he was in the back seat of a station wagon, not belted in, and they hit head on uh, another car, and he went all the way through the car and hit the windshield. And it damaged his leg, it messed up some of his speech capacity, his sight capacity, and uh, he had learning disabilities and physical stuff to work through his whole life. And uh, I got to know him, he was about 10, 11, 12, and he was a friend of mine. They went to our church and stuff. And this, this uh, student, this young man, having been these givens in life, as a wh white, white guy, his parents were divorced, living with his mom, this accident had happened. So he, you can imagine the surgery he was in as a kid, the givens, you know, he didn't ask for this. It just happened. And uh, so he began this long, arduous journey of trying to make something of his life and become something. And uh, lo and behold, as he got to his senior year of high school, uh, he, he joined scouting when he was 11, and he got his Eagle Scout deal. Does anybody have their Eagle Scout in here? Anyone in here? Uh, 
and uh, she, you know, got all the merit badges, did all these things you're supposed to do. I, I uh, we got lost when I was uh, my second year in scouting on a five mile hike and went 12 miles, and I said, I won't be doing this anymore. Um, so I didn't do the whole scouting thing, but he did, and he I was invited to go to his uh, uh, being getting his award, and a uh, chaplain, Episcopal priest from St. Luke's Hospital gave this talk about this young man's life. He was like 17, um, getting ready to graduate from high school. And he read what I'm getting ready to read to you there. And so the next day I call the guy up and I said, that was fabulous. Can you send it to me? And he says, absolutely. So I'm reading you was actually read by this uh, Episcopal priest at this uh, student's deal. Uh, his Eagle Scout presentation. Walter Andenberg wrote, there are two great sources of inspiration in life. Enthusiasm, and we'll call that inflation. That's interesting. And tragedy, we'll call that reductionism. Deflation, tragedy. Life's reduced to this problem. Enthusiasm is, wow, let's go get it. Let's do it. In theos, in means in, and theos, enthusiasm means God within. So we're on a high, into the heights. He says, there's two great inspirations. One is enthusiasm, the other is tragedy. I have been boxed in by both, but having been boxed in, I also recognize that perseverance is the key to escape and satisfaction. Throughout history, there have been those who were willing to risk and to persevere in the face of adversity. There have been those who have been written off and yet have become real contributors to society. And those who have yet to shine, which would include all of us in this classroom and in the world, we're still shining. Bury him in the sor snows of Valley Forge and you have George Washington. By the way, in the eight and a half years he was head of the, of the Continental Army, he only spent two nights at home. He, lit, he stayed in 208 different homes in eight and a half years. And much of his problem was trying to keep the uh, uh, American fighting people, the, the colonies, these people, fighting because they all had farms to keep and people to deal with and it was hard just keeping the thing going but at Valley Forge you know he he thought it was all over um, and and just reading the story of George Washington's life which I'll be doing I read it always around President's Day uh, I pick a president and read about them just for my own stuff um, see these people dared to follow becoming their true self based on the givens they had raise him in abject poverty and you have Abraham Lincoln who by the way uh, I think was educated through the third grade and all the rest of his learning he did on his own. He became an authority of Shakespeare. A lot of people don't know this. And uh, John Hayward, I think it was one of his 25-year-old aides who was a Shakespearean actor who later became Secretary of State. Uh, they would stay up late at night in the White House and talk, do Shakespeare. Shakespeare was probably one of the great first psychologists of the Western world. And that's what got him to Ford Theater is because he loved plays because the psychology of the world is in the stories. Um, but I've always been uh, interested in Abraham Lincoln's life um, given what he had. Uh, subject him to bitter religious prejudice and you have Disraeli. Uh, I'm not, I don't know a lot about that. Any of these people that you want to write uh, a page, page and a half on, about them that, that stimulate you, that's good extra credit stuff. Don't just run it off on the uh, 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 email, I mean on the website or what is it? The internet. But you know, write about it and some of these may be very interesting. Strike him down with infantile paralysis in midlife and he becomes Franklin Roosevelt, the only president to be elected four terms. Have him or her born black in a society filled with racial discrimination. You have Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman, Marian Anderson, the opera singer, George Washington Carver, or Martin Luther King. I've read George Washington Carver's life. And you know, he was, at the time, offered $10,000 bonus from Thomas Edison to come work with him in New York, in uh, Washington, D.C. Edison is one who provided these lights. Did thousands and thousands of inventions. Many of them failed. Many of them were burned up and a huge tragedy he had. Uh, but George Washington Carver, there's a, an old story I heard, an old play, and if you'll pardon my southern dialect, he said, Master God, teach me all there is about the universe in this story. He says, this is George Washington Carver. And he says, and Master God says, George, you're not ready for that. He said, well, Master God, teach me about uh, 
this world and everything about this world. And Master God says, George, you're not ready for that. Well, Master God, teach me about human beings and what it means to be a human and the mystery and the wonder of a human being. And the, the, story, the play goes, uh, Master God says, George, you're not ready for that. And he says, well, Master God, teach me about the peanut. <laughs> and, he's, and Master God says, George, for that, you're ready. And the man made 307 items out of a peanut. He once served some of the most famous politicians out of Washington, D.C. who came down to Tuskegee, Alabama. I might have missed that. Where he was given basically a junkyard to make a science lab out of. And he served them a seven-course meal. Everything they ate was from peanuts, and they didn't know it until the end of the meal. So you begin to see someone, how they take their gift, the givens, and live it out. He, he made 110 items out of the common potato, including paper and glue and all kinds of interesting things. To call a slow learner retarded and write him off as uneducable, and, and you have Albert Einstein, have a thalilamide boy born a dwarf twisted body without arms, and you have Terry Wiles, who with the aid of a mechanical device learned to play the electric organ, steer a motorboat, and paint and paint. <laughs> Amputate the cancer-ridden leg of a handsome young Canadian. And I remember this. This was in the late 70s. And you have Terry Fox who vowed to run on one leg across the whole of Canada to raise a million dollars for cancer. Terry was forced to quit halfway when cancer invaded his lungs, but he managed to raise uh, 20 million dollars. When he was a lad of three, he burned him so severely in a schoolhouse fire that the doctors say he will never walk again. And you have Glenn Cunningham, who in 1934, that should be, uh, set the world's record by running the mile in 4 minutes, 6.8 seconds. Let a British fighter who lost both legs in an air crash fly with a, with a uh, RAF. And you have Doug Bader, who, lost, who with two artificial limbs was captured by the Germans three times in World War II and escaped three times. Are you looking at your limitations, the things you got the shaft on, the race, the color skin, the parents, the education? You see how all the givens we have, and yet these people are said, these are the givens, and yet they still move through life. It's, I think it's very inspiring. Blind him, you have Ray Charles, George Shearling, who I don't know who that is. Stevie Wonder, I know who that is. Tom Sullivan, I know him. Alec Templeton, and Hal Krentz. I don't know who Hal Krentz is. Label him too stupid to learn, and you have Thomas Edison. Make him the first child to survive a poor Italian family of 18 children, and you have Enrique Caruso. Have him born of parents who survived the Nazi concentration camp. Paralyze him from the waist down when he's 44, and you have the incomparable concert violinist Isaac Perlman, who I've seen twice perform at Jones Hall. And, and, you know, I'm single. I've been single for the last 10 years or so. And I go down there by myself with cash in the pocket and just try to find a ticket. And half the time people say, hey, hey, Gan, you want a ticket? And people give me tickets. But I couldn't wait to go see this man. And uh, if you've never seen him, you ought to do, do it. It's so inspiring. He takes a long time to walk out across the stage because he has polio and he walks on these crutches. And he turns and sits down and he picks up the violin. And... You just can't believe what this man can do with that violin. And then at the break, he gets up and he walks out. And everybody has to sit there quietly waiting while he w leaves. And those who, have, who can see and hear the depths of life know that there's a miracle happening before them. Because in spite of all this, he stayed with it. Somebody once asked uh, Itzhak Perlman, they, they said, Gosh, I'd, I'd give my life to play the violin like you. And you know what he said? That's what I did. I read uh, uh, an article once that Perlman was in a uh, was playing with a symphony in a major town, and he broke a string at the beginning of the symphony, and he was the featured artist. And what he did, there's four strings on a violin. He improvised with the other three. Just keep playing. I'll figure out how to play it. See. Uh, we all have these things within us. Uh, make him a hopeless. Call him. Make him a hopeless alcoholic. You have Bill Wilson, the founder of. Alcoholics Anonymous. Tell her she's too old to start painting at 80 and you have Grandma Moses. Afflict him with periods of depression so severe 
with a, a girlfriend. Uh, he cuts off his ear, and you have Vincent Van Gogh, who, by the way, didn't sell any paintings when he was alive. Uh, list, your list would be incomplete without a smiling Max Cleland. He's actually in the news nowadays. Uh, who lost both legs and an arm in Vietnam and formerly headed the VA. He just got defeated as senator from Georgia. And I think he may be mayor of Atlanta. I don't, th I don't know if he is, but I saw him on TV. Don't forget Patricia Neal, the fine actress who suffered a severe stroke but rehabilitated against overwhelming odds and blind him at the age 44. And you have John Milton, who 16 years later, when he was 60, wrote Paradise Lost. It's one of the great works of Western world. Call him dull, hopeless, and flunk him in the sixth grade. You have Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England through their toughest time. Punish her with poverty and prejudice, and she may decide to become another Golda Meir, who was the first woman prime minister of Israel, I think. Pit her against sexual discrimination. You have Madame Curry. Tell a young boy who loved to sketch and draw. This is what the editor of the St. Louis paper told him. That you have no talent, and this world is not ready for a cartoon about a mouse. His name was Walt Disney, and what was the mouse's name? Mickey Mouse. See, um, and yet he continued to believe there was something within him. There was a life to be lived. You get it? You get what I'm saying? This this third thing, the willingness to become your true self against the odds, whatever they are, and and. Uh, take a crippled child whose only home he ever knew was an orphanage, and you have James E. West, who became the first chief executive of the Boy Scouts. Rate him as mediocre in chemistry, and you have Louis Pasteur, who those of you that had milk this morning know that that milk was free of bacteria because of uh, it was pasteurized. Uh, at birth, deny a child the ability to see, hear, speak, and you have Helen Keller, who is one of my heroes throughout life. Um, she had two college degrees. They weren't honorary. She got two college degrees. And she was born unable to speak, hear, or see. And, and she's kind of, people kind of, you know, we kind of don't know her because we're always pushing in these pop stars, media, keep it going. And some of these people who lived great, heroic, wonderful lives, uh, are, uh, I find uh, students nowadays don't even know about these people. Um, they, they don't sell on TV, do they? Nobody's going to buy a product by bringing some of these people on the air. And yet, to me, they're the real heroes of life, just like many of you are because of what you overcome. Um, take seven, uh, no, make uh, him second fiddle in an obscure South American orchestra, and you have Toscanini. Take seven astronauts and watch them die in a fiery inferno, and you have the servants of the future of mankind. Now, this was written around the Challenger in the late 80s, see? And what have we had since then? We had Columbia, didn't we? And that's been something that uh, touched the visceral of, of all of us because to see those seven wonderful people uh, through a pound and a half piece of uh, insulation, a pound and a half a piece of insulation took that whole plane down because it broke off and hit the wing. They, did, they didn't have any padding to protect the wing. A pound and a half of insulation. Your notebook probably weighs that, maybe a little more. Isn't, isn't there something just really spooky about now, That's that limitation. That's that reduction. That, that's that we can't make it all happen. Sometimes things happen that we can't control. Spit on him, humiliate him, crucify him, forgives you. You have uh, Jesus the Christ. He says this Episcopal priest said, close with this, when our days are darkest, we might remember them. When our days are brightest, we might remember that God has given us a life and each one should reach higher in the heart of caring. Anyway, uh, the hope for the world is that all of us take this journey. It will, you, you will find the depth and breadth of diversity, something that will enrich your life if you're taking the journey of becoming yourself. And we'll be looking at more at that. Any questions or comments about that? Uh, did, if, if any of these strike you as like, well, I wonder who that was. Go look it up, write a page and a half or a page on it, and turn it in for extra credit. I usually have four or five students that do that. Your interest is what I want to awaken See, on the, all our extra credit stuff. Okay, well, that's a lot of stuff. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, we have a presentation today. Are you all ready? Kind of, sort of? Kind of, sort of? 
uh, Hasib and uh, Karishma are going to come up and talk about our readings today. And let's give them a rounding cultural psychology, University of Houston <laughs> applause. I'll get out of the way. All right, Dr. Again, <laughs> just move. Will you? In literacy, second one was two nations, both the black, and the last one was cultures increasingly clash in workplace. Um, actually, I was going to try to present the first one, uh, and I start. I wanted to start off with a question. Um, this whole article is about um, John Ogbu and why he's trying to answer the question: Why do some minority groups continue to experience difficulty in acquiring literacy? And um, I guess, like, I just wanted to ask y'all what y'all think about that. I mean, he splits it up into two groups, um, involuntary immigrants and voluntary immigrants. I think Dr. Agan talked about that before. And uh, involuntary immigrants are the ones that came here uh, forcefully. Uh, an example of that would be black, black Americans that came here. And uh, voluntary Americans would be uh, maybe Asians that came here. So uh, what are your perspectives on why he says that Voluntary immigrants do better in schools than involuntary Americans. So what is your perspective on that? Anybody want to raise your hand? No. Yeah, why would that be? Why, why? Go ahead. That's fine. Well, I, I did my uh, essay on this article because it was due. Um, yeah. One of the main things it said was um, peop uh, the voluntary immigrants, they come here um, with a willingness to work and strive to be better and they take they bring this work ethic from their own homeland and when they think about uh, even if they have a hard situation in America they still look at being here as better than being at their homeland because they're in a new country of full of opportunity in terms of the involuntary uh, minorities uh, main example Agbu uh, used was that uh, he said that they're less inclined to be successful because throughout the history the, through this ah, excuse me for the same achievements that they've uh, achieved as white folks they haven't received the same rewards so that implicates a sense of less effort in order to be more successful anybody else no And then he talks about the cultural models. Anybody have an idea of what a cultural model is? Or the, what they think a cultural model is? OK, guess not. <laughs> Did y'all even read? <laughs> OK, John describes a cultural model as an understanding that people have their universe, social, physical, or both, as well as their understanding of their behavior in that universe. Anybody have any ideas about that? Or yeah, any viewpoints? Do you have a question that's more like, provocative or yeah. stimulating? What are y'all's ideas? Because we may have, uh, our brains may not be working. Do you think everybody has the same definition for a cultural model, or does it vary by different races or cultures? Wow, don't raise your hand at once now. <laughs> yeah, right. Guess not. <laughs> well, why don't you talk a little bit about it, okay. and then and then we'll jump in in a minute. Okay. What John says in the article is that he believes that members of a society develop their culture model from their past history, and that's what they kind of use to make their social life when they come here, I guess. I don't know, I was kind of confused myself when I read that, so... I well, yeah, but I, I, think it, some, I think he's saying that they come with a culture that's already existing, and we look for that culture to connect with, for identity. Kind of we're in search for it. Yeah, absolutely. We, we all do that when we go to lunch. If you walk over to the student center, you know, if, if you're going to hang out with somebody, you're going to make all these, you're going to look for a certain model of people to hang with, necessarily. Okay, uh, one more point that he addresses is that um, that when both of these people come here, involuntary and voluntary minorities, when they come here, they both they both they both face discrimination from uh, from white Americans, and so he's like 
He says that why is it why is there such a difference if both of them experience discrimination? Then why why is one section doing like better in school than the other section if they both face discrimination? And his answer to that is that the way that they deal with the discrimination. He says that voluntary um, immigrants deal with the discrimination by by like helping them. They they take it as like oh, okay, I'm a I'm an immigrant here, so that's why they're doing that to me. You know, like I'm not up to their status. So then they say that like by gaining an education and and going further on with education, that's how they overcome that. Uh -huh. And he says that involuntary Americans, I mean involuntary immigrants, uh, they sort of see it the same way, but there's a reason why they lack the initiative to take education. So why do you think that is? Yeah, that's that's what what I was uh, you did a pair of practice, which was a Freudian slip, when you said uh, involuntary Americans, because that's interesting. They're, they certainly didn't volunteer to be Americans. Well, why do you think that is? Some of the black students here might speak to that even, or anybody? Uh, what? Sometimes uh, it said in the article that uh, involuntary minorities look at the stuff they have to do in order to achieve success as being too much for them to overcome. So they look at it as they can't live up to the standard of what a success is in America. I think the other thing uh, the article talks about too was the fact that uh, many voluntary Americans are coming over and there's already a group set up. You can move into the Italian barrio or the um, Chinese quadrant or whatever where uh, when the, there were black slaves that came over there was nobody to bond with. They, were, they came here at property treated as objects uh, essentially with their culture, uh, you know, dispersed and spread. Of course, they eventually found their own culture and created their own, but uh, they didn't have any support. Okay, so then moving on to the next article. The question? Do you have a question? Yeah, anybody? Oh, okay, go ahead. Statement. Push the button. Um, another reason I think why involuntary immigrants um, see it that way because they lose hope. Because at the same time, you got to think that um, most, as I should put it, most black Americans, we see it as though, I mean, we stay here, but at the same time, you have to conform to other races, or as I should put it, I don't mean to be racist, white Americans, you have to sometimes form yourself to be successful in society. Because it's hard, even dealing with it, um, other immigrants. You, it's kind of hard if you try to be yourself, and it, it, it's just harder to to see to succeed in life. You gotta almost conform to the white American. Because you feel like you should be more of what they're trying to force you to be to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, personally, I'm a voluntary immigrant because my parents just came over right before I was born. But because most of my friends are part of the involuntary immigrant, you know, society, I guess, it's like talking to them, they have a mindset that they have a glass ceiling. They have a place where they, they're not going to be able to go above this place. I mean, it's already set for them. They feel like the white man, no matter how high you get, the white man is always going to be above you somehow, somewhere. While immigrants that come over, while they're in that other country, they're, they're thinking to themselves, when I go to America, I can be anything I want to be. The sky's the limit, you know, I, the world's my oyster, you know. But involuntary, I mean, they came over here, they, they came over here as property, which means that before they even got over here, they already had a limit. Cool, cool. So basically, it's just so that you're like passing that still it on. Exists, like, this happened like about a hundred years ago where white people were like, okay, we're superior. So you're saying that that mentality still exists? Probably um, 400 years ago. I mean, it's always going to exist because you always take something from your ancestors. You're always going to, you got um, things that you, you trace, gene, you know, mindsets, you learn from them people. And you keep like you learn most of the stuff from your family and schools, but still there are barriers at schools too. Education systems all messed up. So, I mean, it's always going to be like that until something major happens, but I don't see that thing happening anytime soon. Let's hear from a white student. <laughs> Charity. <laughs> just kidding. Go ahead. Um, Not because you're white, but just be. <laughs> okay. um, I see culture as something like, in my mind, I think culture, and this might be wrong, I don't know, but 
I see as maybe how they talk about your beliefs and your norms. I mean, I, you know, I'm all kinds of different things. I'm Cherokee Indian. I'm all these different things. But my culture to me is um, the beliefs and the values that my parents have taught me and the people that I surround myself make up my culture. And I think um, even not on a um, nationality um, racism or whatever, but I think on a just a cultural, I think we experience that that there's a um, there's something that soci society expects of you, and if your um, culture is not does not believe in that or is against that or opposed or teaches you values that are not um, to conform to that, then you feel that same way that you're not going to be able to make it because you don't want to conform to the to the society. Does that make sense? So you're not going to, so you have this feeling of, well, I'll never be able to make it to the top because I can't um, get past that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. But, but there are things that the black students experience that none of us understand. Because we can, it's like me experiencing birth. I, I'll never know what it's like to be a mother like that. But there are things that black students come in with that glass seat. You know what I mean? Never being a mother, me never being a mother. Don't you agree with that? There's That's things true. that yeah, I agree with that. And like in this article, they even said that um, that one reason this is kind of denied by the author of the article, but it says that one of the theories that why uh, blacks might not do as well in school is because um, they face discrimination like directly from the teacher. Like the teacher doesn't believe that they can do as well as other kids in the class. So I mean, like, what do y'all say about that? Any anybody? Have y'all like faced that before, or have a teacher like somewhat? take favor of another kid yeah no I think that happens a lot more than we understand you, yeah. usually maybe we're not aware of it when it's mm -hmm. happening have, have most uh, Asians and, and uh, so southern Asians and you know Far East people in here uh, see I, I'm not even comfortable labeling like that but have y'all experienced that kind of glass ceiling in the United States or do y'all see that like black students do or do you feel pretty much you can do whatever you want to do Pursue whatever you want to pursue. That's interesting. Good. Do you have a comment? Um, I guess it's like something that makes me like think a lot is because after um, I guess talking about like culture and everything in, in this class, I spoke with someone you know outside of class, and I guess they asked me about as far as being Asian or you know my culture, you know. Like describe it what makes it so different and I really can't describe it because my values what my parents taught me mm -hmm. I think is what every parent teaches their children mm -hmm. so it's something that you can't really distinguish as you know your Korean background right. or your you know Asian background and right. just getting on the topic of culture it's like I go kind of nuts just because I probably end up contradicting myself it's so hard much to define just because of the yeah. fact that my views on everything are kind of different than most people just because, mm -hmm. you know, being biracial. Right. And, you know, if you have a... It's like depending on, I guess, I live with my father. Right. He's Korean. Right. And my mother is also Korean, but she's half right. Irish. So right. she has a lot of hatred toward that Asian side. So it's just kind of like listening mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. That's how she felt. She felt that she couldn't somehow... Um, I guess in society she felt like she had to stick with her right you know Caucasian yeah. like she didn't want to even like I guess she wasn't even proud of the fact that she was part Asian just because of the fact that she felt that that would you know like somehow get in the way of what right. she wanted to do with her life so maybe that I can understand now as I got older you know right. but that's the only thing I can say but tell you the truth being Asian I don't really think that we have any at least not as compared to like you know black Americans right thank you that was great Good. Are y'all done? No, nope, one more. Go ahead. I have an experience at my um, job. I work at Kroger's, uh -huh. and I'm a cashier, and I've been there for almost three years now. And so, like, I want to move up in my position, and I want to work in the booth, but, you know, you handle a lot of money. And our head booth person, she's Hispanic, and my manager, well, my supervisor, he's white, and he told me that she's the one who can, I mean, move you into the booth because she's the head booth, so she picks who she wants. And she told him that she wasn't going to put any black people in the booth because they don't know what they're doing, they constantly steal, and she doesn't trust them. So I feel like I'm limited at my job because 
that's the position that I want, but I know I'll never be able to get it. You made these huge sweeping stereotypes. Black people don't know what they want. Black people are not good at that. She told them that black people still, they don't know what they're, like as far as like money, they're not right. educated. Right. And to, you know, handle that kind of stuff. And she, and he told me this. Right. And I was like, well, why do you keep her here? And it's just like at Kroger's, it's hard to fire people. Right. But we don't have any black people working in the customer service booth. But she's not white, she's Hispanic, but that's just how she feels. Wow, interesting. So I do feel limited at my job. Like I'll never be able to move up. Okay. Wow, thanks for sharing that. Okay, now we'll go to the next article. It's titled Two Nations, Both Black, and it's by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. This one talks about segregation and races, racism stood in the way of blacks succeeding in um, such fields as law and medicine. I mean, they were given the images and the ideals of professions like that, but what stood in the way was them being discriminated, and, and they had to overcome those obstacles. <clears throat> then it talks about how the members of the black upper middle class, the hairs of the talented tenth, were isolated from the black underclass. And basically what the talented tent to me was like the the black people who were educated and they were they were more focused on their education and they you know stood behind that and they were they were I guess they um, paid attention more in school and their whole idea was that education is important and that's how you're going to succeed in life. And then it also talks about how the black space um, racism as police harassment, insults, and wage discrimination, something like what she was talking about, right. how she can't move up to the higher position because of because she's black. And then <clears throat> it talks about how the white, co the white colleagues at school in mostly white neighborhoods see blackness as a sign of inferior inferiority. And Hen Henry Louis Gates says that there are three things we can do about this. First of all, he says that the blacks need to stop feeling guilty about it. It's, own, it's their own success. They need to follow in their own success and follow. Um, they need to succeed as a community rather than community and individually rather than following the, the past. Second, he says that we don't have to fail in order to be black. Far too many say that, this is out of the, book, the article, he says far too many say that succeeding is white Education is white. Education and believing that you can make it is white. And that's the same thing. We need, we need more success individually and collectively. The third thing he says is we don't have to pretend. I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> that we don't have to pretend any longer that 30 million people can be members of the same society. The main task to, is to get social programs that are more different for, that make a difference for motivated for, that make a difference for those motivated to seize expanded opportunities. And he gives an example about one way to do that is by taking people off of welfare and training them for different occupations so they can succeed in life. Great. Anybody have any questions about that? Oh, go ahead. I, I believe in that also because um, Honestly, in a way, to me, welfare and helping out people by just giving them money is a setup. Because it's always two sides to everything. At the same time, I know there's people that's with disabilities that's not able to work. I understand that they get welfare or whatnot. But people that have kids and don't want to work and the government giving them money, that's a setup. I think, as you just stated, it is a good point to actually teach people, not just blacks, not just Asian, whites, whoever on welfare, to teach them the traits they need to actually succeed in life instead of just giving them money and having them sit on a butt because that's just a setup that's all I think about. Yeah, because the only way they're going to learn is through experience and we've already when all of us I'm sure have been through that. Any other comments? Okay the last article was cultures increasingly clash in the workplace. Most people have probably experienced this situation. Have y'all ever been in a situation where you've been let's say you went into a nail salon and Usually, m most nail salons are Asian people. And let's say you sat down and they're talking in Chinese or whatever language they speak. Do you feel like they're talking about you? Yes. <laughs> y'all do, right? <laughs> are they? I mean, have y'all ever done that to other people, though? Yeah, if y'all own the nail salon, I mean, like, 
or any other place. I'm pretty sure that some of y'all would. Go ahead, go ahead. Because I've been in the, I've experienced that. I'm myself. not gonna lie. My family does talk about other people. <laughs> They talk about every customer that comes in. What, what does your family do? Huh? What does your family do? Uh, um, my aunt owns a nail shop uh-huh. in Umble. <laughs> Last time I was in a nail shop, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, having my toes. No, I, I've, I've done that a few times. It's been interesting. But, but do you, people who have a second language they often use it? to communicate about yeah. people who I mean, don't I speak admit it. it. I've done it at work, too. I used to have a coworker who spoke the same language as me, and we would talk about the people. I mean, it was just, it was just natural. That's it just so happens. mean. <laughs> we wouldn't be that cruel about it. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, when I would go to eat with some of my Persian friends, if we had, like, a really sorry waiter or something, or the restaurant wasn't good, we would, we would bash the restaurant in our language so bad. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm guilty, too. That's called the shadow. We'll look at that later on in the class. The shadow, the dark side, as it were. This article specifically talks about this Anglo lady who went into Supercut uh, hair salon to get a haircut. And there was mostly Hispanic people working there. And she went there and the Hispanics started talking in Spanish. So what she did was she complained to the management that they were being rude and that they Mm -hmm. were talking about her. And then it happened, that was in... New Mexico. That was the one in La And then they did another one that was in New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the same thing happened. The customer complained to the management that their employees were being rude to use a foreign language in her presence. And then from there, what happened, after she complained, um, a senior executive from the franchise made um, a little memo that said that the Hispanics weren't allowed to talk in their language unless they were using it to translate to somebody. And since uh, after that happened, uh, it was called a word of English only policy. And the Hispanics, they came up with the round table and they wanted to negotiate with the franchise owner. They were demanding that they, they should get paid 10 cents more or even more than that because they spoke another language and that since they had that special skill, they should get paid more for it. Let's see. How many get paid more for having a second language? Anybody in here? But then towards the end, it says that the executive who said he would do that, it didn't end up happening. He broke his promise. And then... um, Yeah, all they did was they called the company to sponsor cultural awareness training and advertise in Spanish language, and then they didn't provide the pay. Because they, one reason they didn't do that was because you don't need another language to work in a hair in a hair salon. All you need was a license for a hairstylist. Right. So they found that they, that wasn't you know worth it to pay them extra. And that's our three articles. Any questions? Big hand, nice job. Way to go. You know, when you take my picture like that, it shows my ball spot. I don't, I don't like you doing that picture like that. One of my friends said, hey, again, you look so young, you need something to look older. Uh, my checkbook shows how old I am. There's nothing in it. Uh, yeah, thank you all. That was uh, great, interesting. Uh, let me just get this out before Sharon, Melissa, and Pablo. Pablo, for next time, where's Sharon? Melissa, are they here? Yeah. You're Sharon, oh. Melissa, and where's Pablo? Are you Pablo? Me? Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> well, they're not here, so Sharon, uh, is Melissa here? What is your name? Melissa. What? Melissa. Melissa's here. Where's Sharon? Sharon's not here. And what is what is your name? J.R.? J.R.? I thought Paula was sitting there. Okay, but anyway, uh, y'all are on for Thursday, so I'll give you their phone numbers. You can go find them. Just doing a little house cleaning for those on TV out there. Uh, let me talk for a little bit about some stuff I'm uh, putting this together. Um, over here, 
And uh, this is a, a cultural psychology uh, with an emphasis on psychology, and some of you will never take another psychology course again. So I want to teach some stuff. I, I've taught this in other classes, but I think it's sort of fundamental psychology. Since we're a 3,000 level course, this is probably really good to, to look at. And let me uh, first just, we talk about this ego, and I want to talk about that because our biggest problems tend to come in the ego. Ego is not a breakfast meal. Uh, uh, per se. It's just the Greek word for I or me and it's the center of your conscious world. It's really uh, it's the the seat of our willpower. You know it's the kind of the part of you that's not going to get pushed around in life. Um, I'm going to sit down here. Um, it's that aspect of your personality which with which you consciously identify. It's the seat of your willpower and it's the uh, it's the center of uh, our decision making. You can tell I wasn't in the I was in the blue group of handwriting in fourth grade. Um, and, and the ego, this, this, it's a, an organ of consciousness. It's a construct. It's like an idea. Nobody has ever seen one, felt one. Is that you, Pablo, out there? <laughs> is he, somebody out there is looking in. Is this Pablo? Pablo? Yeah, well, come on in, man. We need you. Um, it's okay. You come in. You can crawl through the door. We have these new slits in our doors here. Um, so this, the ego, this, uh, um, the center of, your con of our conscious world, it, it's, uh, it's partly uh, inherited. And those of you that have been around psychology know that's what we would call nature. <laughs> and then it's also partly what? Um, partly acquired. Um, and how is it acquired? It is acquired from yeah, from our acquired uh, from our environment. And what's that called? Nurture. nurture. The two big words in psychology. Is it nature or is it nurture? I tend to teach more, most psychology uh, we'll get in college campuses, most of the time behaviorism and cognitive and uh, social learning theory is really about nurturing. And of course I've committed my life to be a therapist and to help people and make healthier families and healthier schools and healthier environments. So I'm deeply committed to the environment we create for human beings. And we find that all the way through the research, all the way through history that kids that are fed and educated and loved in safe environments, they tend to grow a good ego. So nurturing is very important. The acorn theory is really more about nature, isn't it? It's saying you, you inherit, you come into this world with some gifts and talents, calling, destiny, character, soul's code. You see, so we see those two things. And I think too often we, we fail to realize that there may be a story writing itself within us. So these two dance together, these two nature and nurture dance throughout the whole of our journey. But the ego is, uh, uh, and it develops in our environment during the first 14 uh, to 15 years, and yet it may be 13 and it may be 17, but it develops, yeah, the first uh, 14 to 15 years our ego is developing. And uh, that, that part of your ability to make choices, uh, develop a sense of who you are. Uh, you're really, our culture identity for a large degree is already formed uh, very early in life. I don't have the stat on it. I saw a deal the other day, there's, they, there are estimated 4,000 cultures uh, in the world. So we might say at one level uh, 4,000 ethnicities, uh, uh, habits, uh, rituals that people do, 4,000. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and so a, a person being born in one culture and, and there's subcultures of family. See, our family is a subculture. You could have 
uh, your, your parents are raising you differently than their siblings are. It, it, there's just many, many different environments. But the ego comes partly from the inherited world, our DNA, our genetics, our soul's code, which is biological and perhaps psychological too, but also from the environment with the, that we're in. And, uh, and much of who we are is, is uh, defined by our ego. Uh, let me uh, show you something here that I do in all my classes. It's a way of trying to understand. <laughs> I love it, ripping that off here. Let me just show you something here. This is just a classic iceberg theory. You're going to see this a lot. Some of you had me before. And um, I think I said this, that one ninth of the iceberg, did we talk about this in here, is above the water. Uh, eight ninths of the iceberg is below the water. This is psychology 101. And above the water is our conscious world. It's what you're aware of. And below the water would be our unconscious. Some people call it subconscious. I like the word unconscious. It's just what you don't know. Isn't, isn't it like both? That makes up a person? No, no, no. Isn't, isn't in the unconscious the sub and then the un? Well, uh, uh, in, in analytical psychology, uh, yeah, some people would call it. Some people would call it the pre-conscious state. Right. There are things you don't quite know, but it's just right below the surface. Um, I like to just call it all the unconscious, whether it's pre or sub. You don't know, and uh, you know it's sort of like uh, freshmen. They don't know, but they don't know that they don't know. And sophomores, they don't know, but they know they don't know. You know. You know, and. Um, Juniors, they know, but they don't know that they know. And seniors, they know, and they know that they know. You see this evolution of awareness that happens over time? And that happens to all of us developmentally. Um, hopefully, you'll keep discovering new things about yourself throughout the whole of life. But this, this uh, simple model here, which is going to be very confusing in a minute, uh, up here is what's called the personal unconscious. And that would be your personal story. There are many latent gifts and talents and creativities in here that are your personal things. Some of you grew up in really abusive homes. You had to, there are things you had to hide and bury. There were wounds and hurts that you haven't dealt with. And they will affect your choice of mates. They'll affect choice of what you do with your life. Personal issues, uh, gifts and talents and wounds and things that we all have that we had to put down and bury, as it were. And then down below here is what's called the collective unconscious. Uh, and that has to do with... Um, and the collective unconscious is all that is, was, and ever will be that we don't know about. And there's a whole lot we don't know about. The collective unconscious is the unconsciousness of all that is. It's collective, meaning it's... Uh, we we'll all share it together. It's not a personal thing, it's a collective unconscious. And we'll look at some of this without getting too deeply into it, but I did want to share a little bit about this. There was a time uh, before desalinization plants came into existence. Anybody know what a desalinization plant is? For 100 points here in Jeopardy, what's a desalinization plant? <laughs> Hello? Anyone? That doesn't need water. That doesn't need water? No, but it has to do with water, yes. What is it? Yeah, they take salt water and they desalinization. They desalt it. They get rid of the water, uh, the salt. <laughs> Keep the water. And actually, before these plants were invented, and if you can imagine those of you in the Middle East where there's not a whole lot of water, fresh water, rivers, as it were, uh, what there was a time there. This was 30 years ago. I remember reading an article in National Geographic where they were going to take an iceberg in Greenland and blow it off with dynamite. <laughs> chop it off, and uh, I can't do this, you know, yeah. it's <laughs> supposed to be the Persian Gulf, as it were, equator here, take it off in Greenland, drag it down across the equator by, uh, with tugboats, pull it around the Cape of Good Hope, is that right, is that what it's called, mm -hmm. and up into Saudi Arabia, and I don't know, do you cross the equator again to get to Saudi Arabia? I'm not sure. But you get the point. The point is, they were going to take this iceberg and bring it all the way down and around, and it would still be economically viable enough 
Because, why? So much of the iceberg you don't even see. It's under the water. But it, it, the melting factor would still be because icebergs are fresh water. They're from s snow and ice and stuff that stick together. They're not salt water. Uh, but isn't that interesting? You can imagine how much iceberg there is because we've seen some big icebergs. But remember, most of the iceberg is under the water. That's a good uh, metaphor, <laughs> analogy for understanding the human psyche, the human personality, is that what we are is just the tip of the iceberg. What you see of me is just the tip of the iceberg. What I see of you is the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to you than what we see. There's so much more to everyone. So what we do is we form this organ of consciousness called an ego. Some people think that means ease God out, which I thought was cute. But it's an ego. And this ego is... This center of consciousness, it's what we develop in order to function in the world. Now follow my dots here. So I'm not born, I'm not a, even a thought, and with, uh, let's see, 700 million sperm from my father, I won the race, <laughs> as did you, and my mother had 450,000 eggs in her, in her fetal state, in her ovaries, so out of 700 million sperm and half a million ovaries, the two that got together to, to form, the professor in front of your class, <laughs> <laughs> made a little herb again. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. You were that way too. But if you ever get depressed, just remember your first race you won. You wouldn't be here if you didn't win that. Uh, and I do teach human sexuality. We have a lot of fun with that. But, but so, so here we come out of the unconscious, see, and then we, you know, we're not aware before we exist. There's a time we didn't exist. And then we move into consciousness, see. And that goes for 70, 80 years. Uh, my, my uncle just passed away uh, yesterday, 88 years. And then when we die, we move into the mystery of the unconscious. We don't know where we go or what we do. We have religions and ideas about that. But the fact of it is, we have these, say, 75 years of consciousness. We're awake, and you sleep eight hours a day, which nobody does. That would be a third of that 75 years of sleep. Are you with me? So that would be 25 years out of 75, you're, not a, you're alive, but you're unconscious. Remember, when you're asleep, you're alive, but you're not aware. Y'all are looking at me like you're on drugs. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So what happens is, we... Um, one of my goals is that we wake up when we're awake. That we become alive and aware when we're awake in these 50 years. and first 20 years, most of us are asleep. So you can say you've got 30 years to wake up. Who are you? Where are you going? What's your purpose? What's the meaning of life? That's why you're here at the university, to wake you up so that you become conscious, so that your choices are choices out of awareness and you take responsibility for them you're no longer some primal person reacting out of your unconsciousness, although there's always more unconscious than conscious. And, and we might say, and pardon this, but just watch, that perhaps the greatest goal of life is to lower the water level so that there's more of myself that I'm aware of. Twenty years from now, when we all get together in this class, I wonder who will be more aware of the depth and breadth of your gifts and talents. Aware of the projections and the things, how we use and abuse other people. Aware of your own woundedness and the things within you, limitations. But will you be at the same place now in 20 years? To put it another way, and I'll take that, that uh, your, what you're saying in a second. If my son's 31, if my son was functioning at the level of a 5-year-old, I would be very sad as a parent, wouldn't I? He's much more aware and responsible. Hopefully at 51 and 61, we're more aware. The, the Carl Jung says you don't become conscious without pain. You don't become aware without pain. That's the gift of reductions and deflations, is they make you humble and they go, oh my gosh. See? Uh, but the idea is to lower the water level. So you have more of your life you're aware of and it's all centered around the ego. Yes. What's your name? I forgot. Eric. Eric, yes. How do you measure awareness? How do you measure awareness? Dang, it's a, I love those questions. How do you measure awareness? <laughs> no, that's so good. I don't know. 
<laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we'll work on it. Yes, of course, I have a lot of ideas, but I don't really know. Um, and so, down here in the unconscious, it, we have instincts. Let me just put this in. And Freud called those what? Id. He called it the id. We'll call it instincts. And then we have uh, our uh, ideals. And Freud called that what? Ego. Super ego. Super ego. And uh, in my little deal, if I can get it here, here's kind of the world we're dealing with. Now watch this. I, I would rather say this is the psyche, which is the Greek word for soul. We've made psyche mind psychology, study of the mind. It's actually the study of the soul of which your mind is part of it, but you're so much more than a mental machine sitting on top of his shoulders. You have a head and a what? Heart? God, they might kick me out of here for saying heart. See? But we often lose heart, don't we? What happened to heart? Oh, well, you get that elsewhere. Well, in my mind, psychology is about head and heart. Body, mind, spirit. It's about it all together to see the whole person. Are you with me? Kind of? Okay, and uh, so we form this ego in order to fit into the world. Uh, and, and watch this. In order to fit in like this, because that's the goal in life, is to fit in to tribe, culture, family, and gain acceptance so we can get food, clothing, and shelter. And yet, the... Um, Acorn theory says that there's a soul down here. There's a, the Buddhists call it a true self. There's a true self at the core of our self. There's that seed within here, and it wants to express itself. And so the ego spends the first half of life trying to fit into the world. It walks away from its true self because it does what mother, father, culture wants. And then it's often, as, as Freud said, the price of civilization is neurosis. Because you walk away from your true self in order to fit in. And so somewhere in the second half of life, we have to listen to this inner world. Now, having said all that, before you go, let me just show you this. Uh, this is what we'll look at next time, is, uh, is the functions of the ego. And let me just do the first one real quickly in a couple of minutes, and I'll go over it. The function of the ego, the first function is to orient us to time and space, orient us to our history. We are plucked from eternity. This is platonic thought. We're not human beings looking from some spiritual connection. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. That's Plato's idea. And most religions pick that up. We are plucked from eternity and the ego orients us to this life. When you get knocked out playing athletics like I did once in Intramurals, University of Texas, I got knocked out for 45 minutes. When they come with a smelling sauce to wake you up, what's the first thing they ask you? Anyone? Your name? Who's president? What's the day of the week? And what are they trying to do? They're trying to orient you to time and place. Hello, McFly. <laughs> Come in. Is anybody there? And you go, yes. My name is Nasal Ferd. I'm in Toadsuck Ferry, Arkansas, you might say. And uh, uh, because you're being oriented to time and place. The gift of the ego is at first it orients us to time and space, which it gives us what's called groundedness. you got to have an ego so you can get good and grounded. For example, be at my class, be dressed, be on time. Be ready to have your readings done. You see what I'm saying? All that's, your ego is doing that for you. It grounds you. And without an ego, you wouldn't be grounded here in 2004. Are you with me? And so the ego is huge. First 14 or 15 years of life, we develop this groundedness. Hi, Jimmy. I know you're lost. What's your name? Well, my name's Jimmy. You just called it. Well, where do you live? Well, my parents are from so-and-so. I'm six years old. You see how that works? All that's ego development. Uh, one uh, quick story in the last minute. Uh, my son I met at a, at a place I was speaking one time, and there was a couple there, and they said, your father has helped us a lot in our marriage, and we, we've learned a lot from him. And my son, who was about 30 then, says, well, my dad taught me a lot too. And I sort of puffed out my shoulders and said, man, this is cool. He said, he taught me not to run in the street. <laughs> and I'm glad I did, because that's how he got that groundedness early. Okay, I'll see you next class, and we'll look some more of this. Great presentations. Thank you very much. Goodbye.